Welcome to this presentation on poetry as effective healing questions and possibilities. In this presentation, I'm going to look at two primary purposes. One is to explore poetry as an example of healing practice outside of psychotherapy. And the second is to explore the question of how do we assess its effectiveness. Uh, personally, I'm a, a big believer in poetry as something that can be very helpful in the healing process. That it, it works in a number of different ways that we can talk about it. I've seen this in my own life and as a therapist working with clients who I've often encouraged to bring in poetry in various ways as part of their therapy process. I've seen it also be very powerful in, uh, as a healing method for, for clients. But I think we need to also connect it to this idea of how do we know when it is truly effective and, and when it is not. And so these are some of what we will we'll talk about here. I'm going to begin talking about the, the theory and focusing on the, the theory. I'm not going to go into great depth about this. Um, there's some other sources that you can go into more depth about some of the, the theory ideas about this. But I want to give a, a tasting of that and then going to spend a, a fair amount of the time actually going through some poems that I wrote and going through a grieving process. And I'll talk about how this was healing in my own life as a, an example of this. I first used some of these poems uh, as part of a presentation that I gave um, at a conference in China about uh, a little less than a year ago. But it has continued to evolve some from then, so this will be a more a full presentation of um, this poetry as a, a healing journey uh, in my own life. A poetry as healing practice, I think we can look at several different things that are part of the healing practice with poetry. One of them is just the expression. And I'm guessing all of you can relate to um, sometimes just needing to get the emotions out. And you feel better after you get the emotions out. We refer to this sometimes as catharsis in, uh, in psychotherapy. And catharsis is getting that emotion out. But when it's just getting the emotion out, it doesn't always lead to any significant change. Uh, matter of fact, it's uh, sometimes critiqued uh, in some approaches to therapy that what clients are doing is they're just coming in and they're expressing, they're, they're getting out their catharsis and they're feeling better from getting out their catharsis. But because no change is happening with that, they're actually becoming dependent upon therapy. And they're becoming dependent upon it because they come in and they let all their emotions out and they feel better. But then they go back out without making any changes at all. So they keep needing therapy and they become more dependent on it because they aren't finding ways to work through the emotions. Uh, in therapy, we often talk about the idea of processing emotions or working through emotions. Now, how does this distinguish from uh, the catharsis or just the expression of emotions? And, well, when we start talking about the processing of emotions or working through them, generally this is connected to some change in understanding of oneself or one's emotions into the creation of meaning. So this understanding and meaning element to it. So for from a depth psychotherapy perspective, for emotions to be processed and move towards healing, what we need to do is experience them, be able to express them, be able to understand them and, and bring some meaning to them. When this occurs, there often will be an emotional shift. And I'll talk about uh, this emotional shift in some of the poems that, that I wrote is that experience some very profound emotional shifts uh, in writing poems. And this can happen at, at different points. Sometimes it happens um, because there's a shift in understanding, and that can come anywhere in the process of writing the poem. Sometimes it's uh, at the end of the poem. Sometimes it's in the way the poem is structured. But there can be these emotional shifts that often are connected to um, some type of new understanding or creation of meaning. That's not always conscious. Uh, sometimes it might be at that unconscious level. Uh, some people experience those emotional shifts and they're not completely sure what it's about. But often it is, uh, is conscious. Empathy and interpersonal connection. Uh, this is something that I've been wanting to look at more and more with the idea of poetry is its role in, in relationships. We often think of poetry as an intrapersonal healing process in a sense. It's focused on ourselves. A lot of my early writing of poetry uh, for healing, it was very much an interpersonal process. I didn't share the poems with people. Um, many of them, quite honestly, were quite bad, and so I was embarrassed to share them with people. But yet, through writing them and through creating meaning connected with them and coming back to them, 
I found that it was quite healing. And this can be one aspect of the, the poetry is healing, it's intrapersonal. But often there is a deeper healing process when they're shared in a relationship. And I'll talk a little bit about this in connection with um, some of the poems that I will go through also and how they, they worked into deepen, deepen some connections. They can also work towards empathy, which I'll talk a little bit about later on too that they can help us deepen empathy and empathetic connections in a couple of different ways um, with individuals who, who share poems. So these can, and that helps deepen the relationship too. And then also deepening of, of self-awareness. <coughs> Often when writing a poem, I'll set it aside and I'll come back to it later. And when I read it again, I'll find new meanings to it that, that often surprise me. And when the poem is about something I've been struggling with, and I come back and look at it later, it often deepens my own self-awareness of something going on with me and something that I've been, been struggling with. And we can look at poems in this regard very similar to how we look at um, dreams and interpreting dreams. There's maybe a little bit more, well, there is a bit more of an intentional process to poems, but there's almost always an unconscious level, particularly around the symbols that we end up being drawn towards in our poetry. They, they have various levels of meaning. So when we come back and look at these symbols at a different time in a different context, often it will open things up for us. <clears throat> there are ways that we can be intentional with poetry then too. And I've used this at times uh, in, in therapy. And one of them is uh, using poetry to contain. And so there are times where we can put on a structure to poetry and that will serve to contain it, uh, contain these emotions a little bit more. For example, trying to write a four-line poem, contain it into those four lines. There can be structure in the sense of uh, the, the rhyme and the, and the rhythm to the poem and, and working on that. Part of the reason, at least I think, in my opinion, why this helps to contain is because when you're focusing on writing a poem in that more structured format, you're thinking a little bit more and you're thinking a little bit differently. You're attending to that part, part of it. And so it serves to kind of contain. I think there's also a symbolism just in writing that structured form that contains the poem a little bit and can help contain the emotion. And so these types of poems sometimes can work in, in one direction towards the emotion. My personal preference with poems is generally to write free verse. That's the, the style of poetry I'm a, I'm a little bit better at. And uh, it's also the one that connects with me emotionally a little bit more. And often this opens things up. And so it allows to um, be more expansive with emotions, go into the emotions a bit more. And then can process from there. Now the containment can be more important sometimes with people that maybe don't have as many coping skills or their coping skills are breaking down and they really need to contain that emotion. But it's, you know, writing the free verse and writing poetry with the intention of kind of opening things up. It's important to be prepared because sometimes it can really open up the emotions too. And then again, using poetry to connect. I've kind of talked about some of this already, but it can be used in a variety of ways to connect. Uh, it can be used uh, to the connect one as the, the listener and as I hear other people's poems get a deeper understanding of them get a deeper uh, empathetic connection with them and that can deepen the relationship however we can also write poems in the voice of another person to try and deepen uh, the connection and deepen the empathy or share poems with people to try and deepen that connection uh, in my relationship with my wife I've shared a number of poems with her and that was a part of um, an important part of our relationship at various points of, uh, of, our, of our marriage and relationship leading up to our marriage. Uh, then there's also this use of writing in other people's voice, which I've often done with clients, I've done with um, people that I've worked with in a variety of capacities in trying to deepen my understanding and, and connection with their suffering. And writing in their voices really helped to deepen that connection. Um, so some of the variants, we talked about this idea of uh, poetry as an interpersonal healing practice versus an interpersonal healing practice already. That we, it can be used within the individual to help heal um, without sharing with anyone. But I often think that there's a much uh, deeper healing when the poems can be shared. Now when sharing poems, I think there's a couple of important things to keep in mind, both as the, 
as the writer and as the listener. In particular, that bad poetry can be good poetry. And what I mean by that is that bad poetry can be healing. Uh, and I can think of a number of poems that I wrote at points in my life that, boy, they're, they're just bad poems. But yet, they were very powerful in my life for some reason, because they had this connection. And so it's important to focus on, on that, to, to let go of this idea of it's got to be a good poem. And often when people are focused on trying to make sure the poem is a good poem, some of that healing aspect of it gets lost because they're shifting the focus a little bit. Uh, when we're thinking about poetry in a healing context, I think it's important to let the poem just come. Let it have its own life in a sense. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't come back later and, and tinker with it and change it. But it uh, is important to let it have a life of its own in a sense. Uh, poetry can also be used in therapy or similar contexts. I've made some reference to this already. Uh, this can be through the therapist's poetry. Uh, I've mentioned a few examples here, but let me mention a couple more of the ways that I use poetry. Sometimes when I come out of the therapy session, instead of writing a progress note, what I'll do is I'll write a poem. And particularly if I'm feeling like there's something missing from that session that I, I couldn't quite grasp, or if I'm struggling and connecting with that client in some way, I might write a poem in the, in the client's voice, or I might write a poem about the session or I might write a poem um, about my relationship with the client. Now, most of the time when I write these, I don't share it with the client, but there have been times where I have. And this has led to some of the really powerful times that I've had in therapies is when I have shared it with the client. But a word of caution with doing that, if you are a therapist and you are thinking about sharing some of your poems with your clients, I strongly, strongly encourage that when you first start doing this, that you always consult with someone that, that knows you before doing this. The poem tends to reveal a bit more of yourself than what you may be aware of at times. And so it's good to think through this. Um, this is particularly useful to do with a colleague that knows you a bit personally, but also knows your professional work. So that can help think through a little bit about whether um, this poem would uh, would work with the client would, and whether what it's going to reveal to the client. It can be very, very powerful, but it's important to be cautious with that. The client's poetry, often uh, at the beginning of therapy, I will encourage clients to, to write poetry. Now, generally, I mention poetry specifically, but will also say, or any type of art form that you connect with. Now, some clients may not feel like there's any art form that they connect with. It's common for people to say, well, I'm just not creative. But it's not just about uh, the, the ability to, to create um, art. Um, and so, as we talked about before, with the bad poems can be good poems. It's not about creating good art uh, in particular. But it can also be about creative ways of connecting with, with the arts. So for, for some individuals, it may not be writing poems or engaging in the expressive arts in any way. It might be about bringing in art that connects with them, bringing in movies that connects with them to talk about, bringing in songs or poems or pictures that connect with them and using that as a basis. So it can be other people's poetry. It can be the client's poetry. But this often can be uh, an important part of the healing process. And again, some of it can be that interpretive thing, similar to how we approach dreams. Uh, some of it can be about the connection. And, and some of it can just be about priming the emotions that we, we tend to often be drawn towards, um, towards art that will intensify our emotions. When people are angry, they often want to listen to angry music that makes them even angrier. When they're sad, often we draw it to sad music that makes them even, even sadder. And this serves the purpose, again, of drawing people into that emotion so they can think about it and experience and, and try and create some meaning out of it. Uh, I think this becomes even more important as today we often become very disconnected with trying to uh, have, make time for our emotions. And as we try, don't have as much time to, to think about a process through our emotions, we need to find some ways to do that. Okay. The effectiveness. Well, just
just was talking about the intensifying emotions, even the painful emotions. Again, this can help. It, it seems strange to a lot of people. How does intensifying emotions help? But it does lead you into them. Uh, and from an existential psychology perspective, which is my background, we always look at the emotions as something that can be a guide that can help us understand what is going on. And when we just numb out the emotions or we just try and cope with the emotions or change the emotions too quickly, then we're, we're not learning from what the emotions can teach us. So going into the emotions, they can, can teach us a variety of things. They can lead us to meaning. They can lead us to different ways of understanding uh, what happened. They can motivate us to go out and make changes. For example, when people have had traumatic things happen to them, sometimes these painful emotions that are experienced can inspire one to go out and make changes in the world to prevent that type of trauma from happening again. And that can be healing from this. So the emotions uh, and intensifying the emotions often can lead to change. It's not about intensifying the emotions, but it's about what intensifying the emotions can lead to. Poetry can serve as memory. And I'll talk about this in some of the poems that I'll read. Also, that they, they capture something, similar to a picture in ways, but a picture captures a certain aspect of what happened at a time in history. Poetry catch, captures the emotions, the meaning. It captures something something different. So it's a different type of picture. And I think even we could think of it as a more complete type of picture at times. We already talked about these emotional shifts, but that can be a big part of the healing. And uh, often the, these emotional shifts that I've had when writing poems for myself <clears throat> have led to long-term change. They haven't just taken everything away. It's not a magic cure by any means but it can create some, some deep meaning. Uh, we talked about the creation of meaning and the changing meanings that uh, poetry can bring different understanding to things. We've talked about this creation of connection. Uh, let me talk about one more, tracking changes. Um, I, I find in, with my own poems, they're, they're never finished. I'm always going back and tinkering with them and tinkering with them and tinkering with them. They're, they're living, in a sense. And often the little changes are, are meaningful. Uh, then we can also see how different poems about the same subject over time can track changes. And I'll talk about that a little bit with the series of poems that I'm going to read you here shortly. And then there is also the idea of um, rewriting a poem. And uh, there's a client I work with, for example, struggling with a difficult relationship in his life and brought in a poem about it and I'd asked for a copy of it which I often often do and he was okay with that and kept it in the in the chart and then after a little while I asked if he could uh, rewrite that poem from where he was at that time and we did this a couple of different times the changes were often small but very significant and they they reflected some changes so writing that the same poem or, or Changing the, the same poem can be one way of tracking changes about how someone feels or experiences something, where they are in the healing process. Okay, poetry as an illustration. I, I mentioned that uh, the poems I'm going to read are about a grieving process. And they were about a grieving process with uh, my dog, Amea. And this is a picture of... Uh, Vimea and I. And Vimea was my first dog and a dog that uh, went through a lot of difficult points of my life with me. And uh, I tend to think she was a an unusual dog as far as some of her empathy and emotional skills and ability to connect, um, not just with me, but with other people. And so that's something that's common with Peps, but I think something that she was particularly adept at. I began uh, using poetry to with the grieving process before May even died, when I first realized that she was getting older. And so the first poem that I'm going to read here, this is a, a poem that I wrote shortly, no, actually it was a couple years before um, she passed away, but as I noted, it was when I, I first started to realize that uh, the time was coming close. We had gone up into 
uh, the Colorado Mountains, a place that we had been a number of times before. And we walked a, a path that we'd walked before. And it was along this stream. And I may have just loved this stream. I remember her as a pup when we'd get to it, she'd go running and jumping in the stream and running through it and just, just really seemed to love it. And this day, she walked down into the stream very gingerly. And I, I saw her kind of look up at me with this look on her face of still being excited. But she couldn't run through it like what she used to. And I could really see her age. And that was something that, that hit me hard and was very sad. And so we went and found a bench. She needed to, to rest. I needed to process. And I wrote this poem. Aging. A Maya girl. We walked past a day we took so many times before. Immersed in your joy, I watch. Your spirit so strong, yet aging. Hampered, you limp through the same stream you chomped through as a pump. Your zest now is strained by aging body. No longer knowing which season to shed. Our walks shorter now. Me, sorrowfully content with the last days of your presence. You, content to be in the nature you will soon join. To me, this poem in particular represents the, the taking a picture of a point in time, of the memory aspect. This not only reminded me of that walk this day where she could no longer run through the stream like what she used to, but it reminded me of the good times when she was a pup and she used to be able to do that. Those were things I didn't want to forget. They were memories I wanted to keep. And so the poem helped me to do that, and still helps me to do that, to remember those times, and to remember how much I loved going up into the Colorado mountains with her and spending that time where she just seemed so happy, so at home. <clears throat> the next poem was a poem that I wrote the night that uh, Amaya died. And it started forming in my head when I was driving home. And then when I got home, I sat down and right away wrote the poem. When the poem was done, it was one of those nights that I felt the immediate shift. As the other poems were illustrated, it didn't solve the issue at all. It didn't solve the grieving. It didn't make everything better. But it was an important part of moving forward in the grieving process. I continue to come back to this poem often because of that. I had to say goodbye tonight. That big old moon wasn't quite full as I drove home tonight. A piece of it was missing. I felt that I was entering a time like that of tonight's moon without the grace of such brevity. You lay on the mat, barely able to look up. I knew of your suffering, when even the salt of my tears didn't draw your tongue. I knew the decision I did not want to make. In the midst of these many strangers, I felt no shame in my tears, no desire to hold back. I never hid anything from you, and now was not the time. I wasn't ready to say goodbye as I held your face cupped in my hands. I stared in those blue eyes the last time. I wouldn't look away, so the face that loved you so deeply may journey with you from that last breath. Then they were your eyes no more. sitting with you on the floor. At times, I thought I saw a breath. I knew. I knew. My walk felt as unsteady as yours a few hours ago. As I walked to my truck in that peaceful night, 
that held no peace for me. Back home it felt so silent, though the noise was no different than the night before. That relaxed phase of crying settled in. <clears throat> this memories bearing the grieving process carried you still with me. But each time I realized there would be no more memories, a jolt sent more tears free. With gasp as gasp for air as if reaching for you. You were always my comforter. So many times I heard you were just a dog. But tonight, more than ever, I wanted you to know I never believed that lie. And tonight, as I held your face through that last breath, I never wanted to say goodbye. I can still remember and even feel the change in emotion when I finished that poem that night. Though the suffering and the pain was still strong, there was some peace mixed in with it. I quickly sent the poem to a few friends of mine that knew of my love for a man I knew could relate to it and who had often, who had also heard many of the stories that I told about Amea. I often used her as an illustration in teaching about therapy. And as I heard back from these friends, and even before, because I knew of their acceptance of it already, I felt the new connections. Part of what sharing does, part of what grieving does, is it connects us to people to fill that gap that was created in our support system. And Amea was a big part of my support system. She was someone that I turned to and, and had with me a lot when I was going through difficult points. And so by being able to reach out to people who had not necessarily filled that role, along with some who, who had, I was able to start to fill, again, some of that gap in my support system. I read this poem as part of a keynote address at a conference in China about poetry and healing. And shortly after that, I got on a train with a group of friends and uh, it just so happened, uh, fatefully so it seems, that I was, uh, my seat was on a different train from everyone else. And while sitting there, I was going back through my presentation, and this next poem came to me. And so this was written on a, a train in China. Uh, very intense emotional experience, again, writing it. Uh, even though there's all these uh, strangers all around me. Even into death. Peacefully, we awoke to the day that would be your last. You lay outside, the sun providing its warmth, the tree its shade. I came outside for our daily ritual. You raised your head to return the greeting, yet your old bones could not sustain as you attempt to answer my call. Fear set in as I helped your old body to its feet. Unsteady, you tried to follow. I carried you to the truck and carried you to the doctor, and then held you as we wait. They took you from me, and they took your blood. Anxiously, I paced. The night was so calm, but I would not accept its peace. As the news came, I resisted every way. I fought through emotions and I challenged the choices as if to keep you from death. Yet, death will have its way and slowly I conceded. You came to me carried on a mat. White coats gave us our final moments together. 
then return not so innocent. I held your face and I held your gaze. I remembered my amazement in our years together. You trusted so completely and did not flinch as my feet danced around you, grazing your hair inches from your face. Neither did you flinch or avert your gaze as I held your face and held your eyes. You trusted me completely, even into death. There are many things in this poem that, that felt very similar to the first in reflecting back. It tied in some memories from the past that, again, I didn't want to forget. And it focused on some key moments. In particular, one of the key moments was when they gave Amaya the injection that would take her life. It was very important to me that right through those last moments, I looked right into her eyes. I had long believed in facing such painful things directly. And so to look directly into her eyes was very important to me. And this was captured in both those poems. And that is something that, though painful, I never want to forget. Holding on to the pain is part of holding on to the, the meaning and the beauty of all the relationship. And at this point, I can't have one without the other. In many ways, it's a choosing that I make to hold on to some of that pain. Because with that, I get to keep some of her with me. And that's okay. The pain doesn't feel so bad. <coughs> as long as I have those memories, too. I wanted to mention an example here from the two poems that, that shows uh, the tracking of changes. In the, the second poem I read, From the Night of Emmaus' Death, there was a line in there, As I walked to my truck in that peaceful night that held no peace for me. Then, from the poem a year later, the night was so calm, but I would not accept its peace. Now that may seem small, but I think it's quite significant. It feels quite significant to me. Because in this first poem, there was something that reflected that I had no control. That it held no peace for me. It was the night's decision, in a sense, to hold no peace for me. But in the second poem, I acknowledged my role in it, that I would not accept its peace. Now this connects to what I was talking about and to, to some of my beliefs about how to face suffering, how to face loss, how to face grieving. That I wanted to hold on to it, that I chose that. And knowing and reinforcing that I chose that I was not going to accept the peace, that I chose that I was going to face this pain directly. That was important. That realization was healing to me. That realization is empowering. So this little shift, and often little shifts such as these, can be very powerful if we're attentive to them. Therapists will sometimes talk about how when clients come in, we hear their story over and over and over and over again. And some therapists, particularly that are new or that aren't as good at listening to the details and the, the little changes, will get very bored with those and get very frustrated with those. And sometimes it's a part of being stuck. But often it's like writing a poem over and over again, tracking these changes in the poem that what the good therapist will do will watch for those little changes that may seem insignificant but actually are not insignificant at all. They're powerful. They're life-changing. So as people tell their story over and over again, we're interested in those small changes that are big changes. <clears throat> this next poem was a, 
written after I had a dream about Emmaus sometime after her death. I think it was about uh, a year and a half maybe after her death. Not quite that long. Last night you came to me in a dream, younger than our last meeting. Standing close, your fur soft, eyes peering blue, calmly nuzzling me, making sure I felt your presence. I embraced you, the touch so real. I knew the visit was not for long and just treasured the few moments though missing you yet and knowing I would miss you once again. Yet all I felt was comfort and gratefulness. You were with me. I, I felt it. I knew it. Reason tells me it was just my psyche's need or symbolic processing. My heart wants to believe it was really you. I don't know. I can't know. Maybe. I shouldn't care. Wheel or illusion. A dream or a visit. I felt you with me. I felt you. For a moment again, you were not dead. I held you while you comforted me just like before, whenever I needed you, and I needed you again. Real or illusion, dream or a visit, I am thankful, and thankfully, I am still missing you. This comes back again then, to that meaning that for me was so important to create out of this that holding on to the grieving, to hold on to the beauty of the relationship, to hold on to the meaning of that relationship. When I woke up from this dream, the poem came fairly quickly, it started fairly quickly, but it took some time for the full poem to get out. I was struck by how real the, the dream felt in many ways and how strong the emotions I noticed in them. And in coming back, I, I think that much of it is connected with what I've talked about throughout here. In the dream, there was some awareness that this was not real. I'm not sure if I, in the dream I knew it was a dream or if in the dream I knew there was something not real about it but yet was able to be thankful, to just hold on. In a sense, those <clears throat> memories and those images were something that was healing and connecting for me. So, <clears throat> in stepping back from this and talking about how do we assess the effectiveness, how would this fare with traditional measures of therapy or healing effectiveness? Now, just even saying that, just even thinking that, when we start thinking about these deep healing processes, in some ways to me feels irreverent. Not honoring the depth and the power of these healing processes. And I don't think that the way that we often think about healing and therapy can uh, apply very well to this. You know, in this particular situation, grieving, of course, is something uh, a little bit different than some something like depression, for sure. But even with the, when we're looking at shifts in how we experience something. In existential thought, we often will talk about not necessarily changing the emotions, but changing how we experience the emotions. We don't take away the anxiety, we change how we experience the anxiety. We don't take away the pain, we change how we experience the pain. This poem, these, or these series of poems, hopefully reflect that I try and live that. I don't try and take away the pain of losing a man. I don't want to. Now, some may say, oh, there's something wrong with you. You don't want to get rid of the pain. 
I'm okay with people thinking that. But holding on to that, again, is part of the, the, the meaning also. But the way I experience that pain has changed. It doesn't feel like a burden. It doesn't feel like a negative thing. Yeah, I still miss a May and wish she was back. Just as I miss many other uh, people from my life. But being able to um, capture that in a different way is something that I think is quite healing. So the traditional measures I think miss quite a bit. There's some limitations in them. <clears throat> I think that there's also obviously some limitations in when we think about uh, what poetry can do uh, to heal. But would encourage you to ponder some of these questions too. What does it capture that is missed with traditional effectiveness measures? Okay, well that is it for um, this lecture. I hope that you uh, ponder the questions. If poetry is something that is uh, intriguing or important to you, uh, hopefully you think about how that, that applies in your own life too.